This is the boombox I built from the Executive 200 Watt Portable Bluetooth Speaker Kit that I bought from Parts Express. I'm going to take you on a tour of this boombox, and I'll show you all of its quirks, features, and options, including how to get this great finish. I'll explain what level of skill you need to build it, show some of the build steps, and share some tips I learned the hard way. Just ruined it, didn't I? And when that's all done, I'll help you decide if this is a build you might want to try. So if that sounds interesting to you, stick around. Before we get started, you can find links to this kit and its options, as well as some of the tools you'll see in this video, in the description below and on my website. Let's start with the amp. It supports Bluetooth 4.0, and also has a line-in port that sounds just a little snooty. Line-in. But you'll need to buy a separate external jack if you want to use it. It has a volume control and four sound adjustment knobs, including treble, mid-level, sub-filter, and sub-level. I'll go into more detail on the volume knob later, because it's one quirky little devil to use. The kit comes with an internal battery charger that holds three lithium-ion rechargeable batteries. You charge it with the included power adapter. The amp is plenty loud enough, although it doesn't actually reach its rated 200 watts with this battery setup. Pause to read if you want to know more. The kit comes with two Dayton Audio 4-inch coaxial drivers with 3 quarter inch silk dome tweeters, which sound pretty good. Not high-end audiophile good, but decent for the price, at least to my ears. It has a Tang Band 5 quarter inch subwoofer which, when combined with a Dayton Audio 8-inch passive radiator in the back and a nearby wall, can really blast the bass. The kit comes with a power adapter jack on the back, but I decided to add some other stuff, like the line-in jack you've already seen. These are from an optional LED kit designed to work with the battery pack. The green light shows it's plugged in, and the red light shows it's charging. And of course the red light turns off once it's fully charged. If you push this button, then from one to all four of these lights will light up, depending on the charge status. The boombox weighs about 20 pounds, so obviously I added a handle and rubber feet on the bottom. It doesn't come with speaker grills, which I think sucks, but I found grills for the coax speakers on Amazon, and I got the subwoofer grill from Parts Express. I can't find a grill for the back passive radiator, although I may end up making my own. Kind of like how I made the head for this electronic drum using copper wire and screen door screen. You don't really need prior woodworking experience to assemble the box, but here's a few tips. The instructions want you to glue everything together first, including the back, but then you have to reach through the hole in the back and do hand gymnastics to install the electronics. I think it's easier to glue everything except the back, then install all the electronics, and then glue on the back. Any decent wood glue should work, but I used Type-On 2, and I was careful not to use too much to avoid glue squeeze-out. Even though I'm not gluing the back on, I am using the back to help keep everything aligned properly while the glue dries. The most important skill you need to build this kit is the ability to follow directions. So I strongly recommend laying out all the parts like the instructions show and getting familiar with the things that identify each part, like the different screws and the different wires. Pay particular attention to the crossover capacitors. The 22 and 15 microfarad capacitors look exactly the same, except for the labels. You have to build the crossovers yourself by soldering some components together. Most of you know what a crossover is, but in case you don't, crossovers take the input signal from the amp and send the high frequencies to the tweeter mama, she told me don't worry. and the low frequencies to the woofer. Because you know I'm... With coaxial speakers, both the woofer and the tweeter are in the same speaker assembly. All about that bass, about that bass. Before I get into soldering the crossovers, let me tell you what not to do. 
I thought it'd be a good idea to zip tie the components to a crossover board, add some little feet, and solder the wires underneath. Nice and clean. Ish. Unfortunately, once you insert the amp, there's not enough room for the board. Even if you remove the feet, the zip ties and wires underneath don't leave enough room. So, I had to desolder everything and start over, which is why the wires on the components are already bent and twisted. At least I didn't ruin anything. As I said before, make sure you follow the instructions and double check that you're using the right components. One thing you don't have to worry about is which end of a component to use. All of the crossover components work in either direction. There's a lot of soldering in this build. Fortunately, it's pretty simple stuff. No circuit boards or anything like that. But since I suck at soldering, don't learn from me. Watch some YouTube videos if you need help. With that said, I can offer a few tips. One is to heat the wire, not the solder. And apply the solder to the wire, not the iron. The second is to keep the iron's tip clean and tin the tip, which means applying a small amount of solder to the tip of the iron. And read the comments I'm sure to get about this. Don't forget to label the wires. And I recommend you get a decent pair of wire strippers, like this one from Irwin. The next goal is to get everything hooked up outside of the box to make sure it all works. And for that, we need power. This 2.1mm DC power jack goes on the back, and you're supposed to solder a wire in this little hole. I'm using some helping hands here, and they're invaluable. Except they couldn't help me from being an idiot, and I ended up melting this part of the jack. I just ruined it, didn't I? <sighs> Fortunately, I had some pre-wired jacks left over from a previous project, and they're much easier to use. If you have any problems soldering the jack, buy a pre-wired one. Since I already had these crossover boards, I hot glued the crossover components to them for a little more stability. But you don't really need them. Then I started wiring everything together according to the instructions. In theory, anyway. And eventually I got everything hooked up. So I tried it out. And it sounded terrible. Very tinny and no bass. I should have stopped right here and tried to debug the problem. But we all know that problems just magically go away if we ignore them, right? If you're only using the DC jack and none of the other options, then all you have to do is attach the jack to the plastic plate, screw the plate into the back, and you're good to go. But the plastic plate isn't large enough for all the extra stuff I have, so I needed to make a custom plate so I could install the LEDs, DC jack, and line-in jack. So I made a prototype faceplate out of hardboard, and I figured out that 2 inches by 5 inches is a good size. Once I had the dimensions, I cut the faceplate from a sheet of quarter-inch aluminum. You can cut aluminum like this using a bandsaw, or a jigsaw, or a table saw like I did. Just remember that if you have a saw stop table saw, you need to use bypass mode or you'll trigger the break. I also cut two pieces of half-inch plywood to the same size. I printed out a template and glued it to one of the pieces of plywood, and punched the center of the holes. Then I sandwiched the aluminum between the two pieces of plywood and drilled all the holes. Now I needed to cut out a recessed hole in the back of the boombox for the LED panel. I marked out where to cut. Then I cut inside the lines with the jigsaw. And I finished with a router. Now that I've got the through hole, I need to recess the inside for the LED panel. I made a router template and routed out the inset. Unfortunately, the panel didn't fit the first time. And this is why I made an adjustable router template, so I wouldn't have this issue again. But since I hadn't made the adjustable template yet, I just kept trying until I got it right. I used CA glue and activator to glue in the panel, just to make sure it was going to work. 
Later on, I'll make it more permanent. As I was getting ready to put it all together, I got to thinking that the speakers and knobs would make it hard to lay the box on its back or on its front. So the first idea I had was to tape blocks of wood to the four corners. But the blocks kept getting knocked off, so later on I created a sort of stand. I made indentations on the sides so I could get my fingers underneath to move it. It would take too long to show every detail of the assembly, but here's the high points. You install the charger board with the batteries underneath using screws that go into the pre-drilled holes. I was anxious to see if the sound's any better once everything's in the box, so for now, I just ran the wires for the coax speakers straight through the holes. I'll change it later on. I attached the wires to the amp. When I screwed it on, I started all the screws with my drill with the clutch on the low setting so I didn't strip out the holes, and then I finished tightening them by hand. More wires. And yes, it's going to end up being a rat's nest in here, because apparently I've never heard of wire management. I hot glued the crossovers down so they don't rattle around. Even if you don't use a crossover board, you should still hot glue the crossovers down. Can you imagine doing all this with the back already glued on? No thanks. This is acoustic foam that you attach to the subwoofer so it doesn't rattle. It's a little tight getting the coax speakers in the holes because of the extra set of wires, but as my mother used to say when I was a kid, you can do it if you hold your mouth just right. I managed to get the back on with a little percussive maintenance. And lastly, I added the passive radiator. It has some fender washers you can use to adjust the sound somewhat. Time to plug it in to see if it works. Well, at least the charging light works. Unfortunately, the sound still sucks, so I slept on it. And with a fresh start in the morning, I realized I had swapped the woofer and tweeter wires. No! I'm really lucky I didn't ruin the speakers. I was so sure I'd hooked them up correctly, but obviously I didn't. There's a reason my logo is a screaming face. Now that everything's working, it's time to figure out what to do with these wires. If I had it to do over again, I'd just leave them going through the holes like this. It's much easier. Just put some tape around the wires on this side of the hole so you can't accidentally pull them too far through the holes. But the kit comes with these binding posts, and the idea is that they're supposed to go in the pre-drilled holes here and sandwich the wood between the plastic parts. Then you take the wires from the crossover boards and attach them to this side of the posts, and on this side, you run wires to the tweeter terminals and the woofer terminals. This way, if you yank on the speaker wires, you can't hurt the crossovers. The problem is, the binding posts that come with the kit don't really fit wood this thick. There's not enough room for the nuts. And even if you don't use the plastic plate on this side, there still really isn't enough room for the nuts. So I ended up buying these new binding posts, which work much better. But as I said, I recommend leaving the binding posts out altogether. And yes, the rats have come home to nest. Before I glued the back on, I painted where the amp and the LED panels go. The paint I used is called Duratex. More on this in a moment. After the paint dried, I re-glued the LED panel with 5-minute epoxy, which will hold much better than the CA glue I used earlier. And then I glued on the back, paying particular attention so I didn't pinch any of the wires. Time to paint everything else. Because the Duratex is so thick, you don't really need to do any sanding, unless you want to soften the edges and corners a little. I covered the face plates with tape, and I stuffed newspapers in the holes so I didn't drip paint on any of the electronics or binding posts. Then I went to work with the Duratex. When you use the textured roller, it gives you this great bumpy finish, really professional looking, and it's held up really well over time. Take your time and apply it liberally. It's a little hard to see thin spots because of the way the light reflects off the bumps. 
The one pint can I got was just barely enough, but it was enough, and I even had enough left over to do a touch-up later on. After the paint dried, I removed all the newspaper and the tape. And here's the result. It really does look awesome. But I didn't like the way the paint looked through the clear plastic faceplate. So I cut a piece of black construction paper and put it behind the plastic. And it looks much better this way. See how much smoother it looks behind the plastic? When I attached the handle, I made sure to position it where there'd be room inside the box to add the nuts and washers. I could have just used regular wood screws, but this box is close to 20 pounds, so I used machine screws that are more secure. I put the screws through the holes in the handle and taped everything in place so I could flip it over. Then I used washers, lock washers, and nuts to lock the handle into place. Yeah, this isn't going anywhere. Except out of frame, maybe. Then I added the speakers and grills, and later I added the rubber feet. I mentioned before that this volume knob is quirky, and it is, although you might not think so at first. But stick with me here. If the box is powered off, press the volume knob to power it on. If you don't have a Bluetooth device connected, you can press the knob to toggle between Bluetooth and Line In. Line in. Press and hold the knob to power it off. If you do have a Bluetooth device connected, you can press the knob to play and pause it. Here's where it gets weird. If you do a double press, like a double click, it advances to the next song. If you press and hold the button, it either restarts the current song, or goes to the previous song, depending on how close to the beginning of the song you are. Which begs the question, how do you turn it off? The only way I've found to do it consistently is to disconnect my phone from the box, then press and hold the volume button. It's pretty easy on my iPhone. I set up a shortcut to turn Bluetooth off and another one to turn it back on. Do an internet search if you have an iPhone and you haven't used shortcuts before. They're actually pretty easy. So I use the shortcut icon to turn Bluetooth off, power off the box, and turn my Bluetooth back on. There may be other ways to turn off the box. If you know of any, leave them in the comments. I gotta say, I'm really glad I built this boombox, and I love using it, in spite of the volume knob quirks. And even though it's from a kit, it still feels really satisfying to use something I put together myself. So, should you build this boombox? I think by now, you probably have enough information to decide for yourself. The most important thing is to read and understand the directions thoroughly. You can change the order somewhat, like I did when I put everything together outside the box. But take your time and do it right. If you're not adding the LEDs and the line-in port, then you really don't need any woodworking skills at all. And like I said, watch some YouTube videos to learn how to solder if you need to. Don't learn from my examples. Don't forget to click the thumbs up, leave a comment if you want, subscribe if you haven't already, and ring that bell so you'll get notified whenever I release new videos. Thanks.